Welcome to a presentation on the outbreak of E. coli in 2018. This is a requirement for my Master's of Public Health class at the University of Florida. If you would like more videos on medicine and health, you can go to my website below, profroofs.com. This is the outline that we're going to follow. We're going to get, start off with a brief introduction about E. coli and the outbreak. Then we'll talk about the methods that they used as they discovered this outbreak, the results from those methods, and then a little bit about prevention and treatment of the E. coli virus, and then a conclusion some words at the end. So let's begin with the introduction. So we're going to be talking about E. coli. E stands for a word that's tough for me to say, Escherichia, Escherichia coli. So we're not going to go into the details of E. coli too much, like, you know, it being gray ne negative and all that, but let's briefly discuss the antigens. So antigens are basically like name tags on a cell. So there are antigen markers, proteins, carbohydrates on the body. And on the body, we call those the O antigens. And on the tail, we call those the H antigens. What I like to think about is when you look at the body, that cylindrical shape kind of is like an O. So I remember the O are on the body. And then the H, maybe it looks like a tail. I don't know. That's where that would be. Okay, so there are six major groups of E. coli bacteria. And the first one is going to be the main one we're going to talk about, the enterohemorrhagic. Hemorrhage, you think about bleeding. Enterotoxigenic, invasive, pathogenic, aggressive, and diffuse adherent. I'm not going to go too much into the differences, actually, not much at all. I'm just going to talk about number one, the enterohemorrhagic, the O157H7 zero group or strain. So O157, because remember O is the antigen, it's marking the body. Again, antigen's like a name tag. So if you wore a name tag, you say, you know, hello, my name is John. That's what it is. So the name tag on this one is uh, number 157, I guess, uh, inmate 157, or however you want to think about it. And then on the tail, it's uh, H7. So that combination makes one of the enterohemorrhagic serogroups of E. coli. So enterohemorrhagic, I just made the H capital here, so you see where the abbreviation is coming from. But normally, it's written with a lowercase h. So enterohemorrhagic E. coli, E H E C. I guess maybe some people say e heck, who knows, whatever. Anyway, so AKA, also known as Shiga toxin producing E. coli. So you'll see it referred to like that in many ways, especially with the CDC and, you know, the Food and Drug Administration, also known as a virotoxin producing E. coli. So all of those are same names and safe abbreviation for the same bacteria. So here's our little bacteria buddy again. And uh, what they're producing is a little toxin. You see that little green stuff that came out right here? That's the Shiga toxin. So we call this strain of E. coli that produces these little proteins that get secreted out the Shiga toxin. And not that you need that, but that, you know there's Shiga toxin one, Shiga toxin two that they look into. So this uh, O157H7 is the major CO group out of all of them. But there are many others as well too within this uh, Shiga toxin producing group. There's actually over 50 different CO groups. Uh, some of the top five right here, the 26, 111, and so forth, as you see right there. Let's move on to the signs and symptoms. The signs are the things that you can measure, and symptoms are the conditions that the patient presents with. So one of them being here is diarrhea, and the diarrhea is often bloody, and that's why it's called hemorrhagic, meaning bloodiness. And, you know, usually with diarrhea comes some abdominal cramps. It's not a necessary component of the diagnosis, but usually it happens. HUS, hemolytic ureic syndrome, is a complication in extreme cases of this sugar toxin E. coli, also known as sometimes thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. That's a mouthful right there. But what is that basically? It is a triad, meaning it's three things. One of them, hemolytic. Hemolytic, meaning that the red blood cells are lysing or breaking apart. By doing that, you're losing hemoglobin, hence you're causing anemia. Another thing is acute kidney failure. Acute kidney failure, there's lots of different definitions to it, but that's where the word uh, uremia is coming from, you know, where you find the urea. You can look at ratios with creatinine and all that stuff. And then the third thing is thrombocytopenia, meaning your platelet numbers are decreasing. So that tends to be a complication. Uh, that, can be cause, that, that can become pretty fatal if um, not treated early. So here's something. Maybe you know this, maybe you don't, but everyone has E. coli in their intestines. When you're born, you don't have it. Actually, you don't develop it in, until about, I think, two days or so after birth, you know, until the system gets going. That's why 
you'll get like a vitamin K injection as a baby. So, you know, the bacteria usually help you to make vitamin K. It's another long story that I'm not going to get into. But basically, just know that two days after birth, that's when you have E. coli in your intestines. So the question then becomes, well, you know, why are we not getting sick? Because, well, not everybody has the EHEC or the sugar toxin type uh, E. coli in their stomach. Actually, they don't. Because if they did, they would get sick. So you have different strains of E. coli. As we remember the other groups we looked at at the beginning, you have other strains, not the ones that are going to cause the bloody diarrhea. But check this out. Cows do have this bloody shiga toxin E. coli in their intestines. So why are they not getting sick? Well, the answer lies in the receptor. Cows don't have the receptors of the shiga toxin, so they can't respond to it. However, humans do, so they respond to it. So let's bring back our little shiga toxin E. coli over here. And over here on the side in the brown is just the line for the intestines. And then these are the receptors right here. I just wrote STX receptor for shiga toxin receptor. I just draw two of them right here. And here comes the shiga toxin, and this would be in the humans. And it would bind right here. You know, there, there's a bunch of processes. I believe it inhibits the protein synthesis inside. And you get the cell eventually is going to die because it can't produce proteins. And then, you know, breaks down and there's blood vessels around. And then you get a bunch of bloodiness. However, cows do not have this sugar toxin receptor. So they won't respond uh, to the sugar toxin. They won't get the bloody diarrhea. So they're basically holding on to it, which basically means they're a reservoir or a host. And it's not just cows, even though they are the majority. There are also pigs and deer and well too that hold the E. coli that produce sugar toxin but don't have the receptor for it. So how does it get transmitted? How does it move from these guys to us, basically humans? And it's through contamination. Let's say that, you know, one of these animals, for example, a cow is going to get butchered for you to eat steak. And, you know, while it's getting butchered, not a pretty picture, but all the intestines and the poop from in there mixed with the meat and then doesn't get cleaned properly. And now it's in the meat. And then, you know, you go to eat it and you don't cook it thoroughly, things like that. Or, for example, the vegetables or the water what happens is these animals poop, goes in the water, goes on the leaf and all that stuff. Not a pretty picture, right? And then, you know, goes to you. You don't wash it. You're like, oh, I don't need to wash it. You get sick. Also, person to person, someone goes to the bathroom. Come on, how many times you see people go to the bathroom, just walk right out, don't wash their hands, and then go sit down at the food court and eat? Disgusting, but that's how it happens. So anyways, um, that's how it goes from these hosts uh, or reservoirs to us. So it's estimated by the CDC that this E. coli that produces sugar toxin, it's about a quarter million a year. So when we go to test it, though, like, for example, in 2015, we only get confirmed cases somewhere around 6,000 and even less, which we'll look at a chart. So why, the first question is, why are we only confirming about 6,000 when really there's a quarter million each year? And, you know, the thing is pretty much that when people get it, and we'll talk about it more later, there's no real tr treatment. It's just diarrhea. So they don't go to the hospital. So it's estimated a lot of people are not going to the hospital. So here's that chart I was mentioning. And on the top, here we have the years from 2005 till 10 years later, 2015, the last column being the total. And on this um, portion right here, on the vertical portion, we have the different zero groups of E. coli, 178, 179, all that. So you're seeing, like, it's not that many. Like 2005, this one, 181, was only tw twice. And you can go through, pause this, look at this as much as you want. I'm not going to get into the much the rough and undetermined and unknown, but that's basically, you know, what was expressed phenotypically, you know, what other systems that they use to test for it. It's a little complicated. Don't worry about it right now. But, you know, let's look at the total for a second. Like, look, 2015, there was about 6,000 uh, that were confirmed versus 10 years before where there was 2,480. So it makes you think, you know, like what's going on? Are our tests getting better? Is there really more of this uh, bacteria you know, there's lots of things to look into, but let's quickly compare it to O157 that we said it's the strain that's the most common. And if you look at that, look at that 2015, there was over 2000 cases right there. But again, look out of the out of the whole bunch, there was 6000. So it wasn't like it was half of them. The one that was the next uh, most common was O26. And if you compare it to the number one rank 2000, it's like, you know, about a third of it right there 869 and I actually you know pulled up a table right here all the references are at the end of this PowerPoint that you can take a look at coming from the CDC and it's ranking the top 10 strains right here that of E. coli that produced the shiga toxin 
157 being the most common here at the top. And if we compare it to all the other ones, like look, 26 is at 869, it's not even close. But what we can do is compare 157 to all the non 0157s, and which one's more? We'll take a look at it. All the non 057s are more 2,700. It's a little bit more than 2,121. So what is incidence? Incidence is the number of new cases uh, per a certain amount in a given time period. So what's the time period we're looking at here? 2015. So basically there was um, 2,121 uh, reported. So that's about 44% out of the 6,000. So the incidence is right here, point one, uh, sorry, point six six per 100,000 people in the year 2015. So you can look at that 0.66 here, 0.84 there. We'll look at this in a little chart coming up. Over here, we're looking at age groups. So we got less than one, and then we have one to four, and then all the way up to 80. We're dividing them basically on uh, the 157 versus the non-157s, and then which in, within each group, females versus males. And if you take a look at it, what age group tends to have the higher incidence of this E. coli that produces shiga toxin. It's the ages one to four. That's interesting, and maybe we can think about maybe weakened immune systems developing, things like that, but it's just something to keep in mind. Here is just the same information, just in a line graph pretty much, and if we're looking at the bottom, the x-axis starts in the 1996, the year of, and goes all the way to 2015. And what are we looking at? We're looking at the incidence per 100,000 cases of the, or 100,000 population. So you can see it's going up, then it goes back down, then all of this, and it goes back up. If you look at, um, just to give you the number, it's 1.5 per 100,000 in the year um, 2015. And uh, for the 0157, it's about 0.7. And the non-0157s is about 0.8, just a little bit more. So what I really want to say is, you know, are is there really more of this E. coli? Is there really more of the sugar toxin? Or are our laboratory methods improving? Are we testing more? Are we doing all these things so that, for example, the O non 157s are being detected more? So those are things to consider. And don't just jump and say, oh, wow, there's so much more of this bacteria now. You know, our methods of detection are improving. So why was the 2018 E. coli incidence considered an outbreak? Like, what made it an outbreak? Because here we are saying that a quarter million people annually get it, and like 6,000 a year have the confirmed cases. The thing is because there was a dramatic increase in the incident rates, or incidence basically being a rate. So what's going on is if you compare it to the previous years, like look at here, I went to the Florida Department of Health website just to pull one state as an example, and I looked at the year 2015, all the counties in Florida, and I noticed that right there, over 100, if you look on the right side, 135 cases of the sugar toxin producing E. coli were reported. 2016, there were less at 84, again, the number on the right. And then 2017, it was 171. And look at this, 2018, 417 cases. And we haven't even finished the year. I did it all the way up until uh, August 5th, which is couple days ago from recording this video. On the Florida Department of Health website, I also broke it up into a little bit more. I kept the same years, 2015 to 2018, that you can see on the left-hand column going down. And then going across the top, you got the months going from January through December. And you, what you can do is you can start to compare the month from one year to the month of the other year. For example, from 2015 to 16, January was pretty similar, five and seven cases and then February 15 to 10. So they, they, they tend to be uh, pretty similar, similar, some slight differences, but then all of a sudden look what happens when we get to 2018. Boom, 48 versus 5, 56 versus 9, right? It's a dramatic increase. So these are what make things an outbreak. When you're looking at the numbers and you're comparing them to previous times and you're like, whoa, this is getting high. This is happening a lot. This is something we have to look at. And then down below, you know, just a, another little graph, graphical uh, illustration. Here it is by age group again, and if you look at that huge bar all the way to the left in terms of percentages of the total for all the age groups for that time period over three years, the ages from zero to four hold the greatest amount of uh, people who are infected with the shiga toxin E. coli over 36%, which you can see over there. That's definitely uh, something to be looked into further. And uh, just the same thing uh, in a different way. I just decided to focus just on the age group from 0 to 4. 
and just over the couple of years from 2015, 16, 17, and then 2018. And you can see like from 2015 to 2018, it more than doubled from 57 to 123. So I decided to think about this and uh, I took the numbers myself and I made my own chart and I said, okay, so if the complication is this hemolytic ureic syndrome, but the original infection is the sugar toxin E. coli, well, what percentage are actually getting converted to this complication? Or basically, who's more likely to have a complication? And although the ages from zero to four were more likely to get the sugar toxin E. coli, they were not more likely to convert to the complication. Because if you look at the average out of 807 cases over that three year period, um, right here you have 26 complications, that's about 3%, a little over. And if you look at that age group, zero to four, it's about the same thing, 3.39%. So who actually had more complications? I looked to see like the teenagers a little bit, those in the 50s, the 60s, and the ones that really hit it were those over 80 to 85. And, you know, I looked at that and I put it there in the uh, bar graph. And I thought about it and I was like, you know what? Well, hemolytic uric syndrome is going to end up with kidney failure, failure. And a lot of people as they get older are starting to have kidney disease. They're on dialysis, the diabetes, the hypertension. So it makes it um, more susceptible or probably more likely to convert to something more complicated. It's just an idea, but feel free to comment below and give me your suggestions or what you know about it. So what was the trigger point for this investigation to get launched basically for 2018? Well, around April 9, New Jersey really kind of was the cherry on top of everything. They weren't the first state to report the infections of this strain, but they really had the majority of them for at that time. So if you take a look at that, there was about 17 reported at that time through seven states during a period of eh, a little over a week or so near the end of March. And what happened is New Jersey had the majority of those cases, about six. And if we think about it, in 2015, the whole year of 2015, there was 32 cases in New Jersey. And now in a week, we have six. So, you know, if you keep that up and you do like, you know, six times 12 or keep it easy, six times 10, that's 60 cases and add 12, that's 72. So at that rate, you're, you're going to look at like over 72. And this is a week. This is not even a month. So you're going to look at a lot more. So this is something concerning. And you look at the numbers and you look at the trends and you start to compare it. So what happened is the CDC is like, okay, you know, a couple of days later, April 10, they say, well, you know what? Something's going on here, but we don't know. Is it a food? Is it a grocery store like your local local supermarket? Is it a restaurant? We don't know yet. So what are we gonna do? We are gonna interview people. We're gonna see what's going on. What were they exposed to? What were they eating? Where did they go? What's in common? And we'll come back and we'll give the public more information. But right for now, we just want you guys to know something's going on. So let's see what they did from there. Moving on to methods and tools that they used to found this E. coli outbreak. So first of all, Anytime sugar toxin E. coli is detected, it has to be reported. It's mandatory. The other thing is, well, what defines this sugar toxin E. coli? First thing to say is, most likely there's diarrhea, and most likely that's going to be bloody. There might be abdominal cramps, there might be a fever, you know, there might be headache, there might be a bunch of other stuff, and then hopefully not, but it can lead to complications of the hemolytic uric syndrome, the HUS. Now, the real way to really define it is basically just to confirm it through laboratory analysis and that's to isolate the serotype or the strain O157H7 which was the one that was detected in this year 2018's outbreak. You can also detect uh, E. coli in culture, basically culture it, and then uh, another way is to detect the toxin, the sugar toxin itself, by either using the anti sera which is basically antibodies looking for the toxin, or to actually do PCR analysis and to find the gene for the toxin. There are other ways to have probable cases, which is basically testing the blood and seeing if there's antibodies to it, or you know other methods other than culturing. But you know, let's just focus here on the confirmation, which is what's listed here on the laboratory confirmation. So April 13, about three days later after the initial announcement by the CDC, they said, okay, well, we started doing some traceback investigations and they're still going on. But as of this moment, we believe that it's coming from chopped romaine lettuce or basically just romaine lettuce. And it's coming from the Yuma, Arizona region, which is about the southwestern corner 
of Arizona near the border of California. So that's what they were saying just you know a couple days into it. So that's pretty good, pretty fast they got to that point. So what happened at that point a couple days later after the announcement, after the initial announcement, they said that 35 people were infected in 11 states. So again, just compared to their initial announcement, which was four days prior, it was about half of that, 17 people in about seven states. So you can see the numbers over there. And what's interesting is if you take a look at the number of New Jersey, New Jersey is seven, just went up like one or two, whatever, didn't go up that much. But if you look at Pennsylvania, which was two, now Pennsylvania is nine, and you'll see at the end ends up being one of uh, the higher states that got infected with this. So then May 31 comes around and the FDA gives an update on the traceback. So what's a traceback? A traceback is basically like tracing back your steps. If you lost your keys, let's trace it back. Where were we here? Where were we there? And so forth. So in terms of this and epidemiology, we start at, you know, somebody tells us, well, the last thing I remember, I was at this restaurant. And let's not say names for no you know bad publicity. But say I, I went to this restaurant and I think you know this happened. And another person says that. It's so like, okay, maybe this restaurant is a you know point of service. Then all right, what's their distribution center? You know, who's distributing it to them? So you trace it back even more. So you like let's say right here. And then the processor and then the grower and the harvester, all the way to get back to the guy who, you know, put the seeds in the ground and what area of the ground he put it in. Right, so you can see it crisscrosses and stuff like that. So what was interesting about this diagram is right there, they had one point where there's no lines and things going all over the place. It was a straight line. And what was that straight line? Well, that led back all the way from Alaska to Yuma, Arizona. What happened in Alaska? There were some inmates in a prison, about eight of them, that got sick, and they were directly getting it from Yuma, Arizona. So that was easy to trace back. Now, what that happened to be, it was a farm, and that farm was called Harrison Farms. They started to get a lot of bad publicity. People wanted to have lawsuits and blame them. But, you know, the FDA and the CDC were like, look, it's not just them because we're getting this from a lot of different places in the same area. So it's coming from some other type of source. It's not just them. So you can't just blame them as, you know, the, the source. So what happened is May 2nd, uh, they confirmed that, there are no more lettuce coming from that area of Yuma, Arizona. And then June 4 to June 8, they're like, okay, well, let's test the area since it's a, you know, it's a it's the location. It's not, you know, one farm per se or one field. So they start sampling the environment. Is it the water? Is it the soil in there? Is it manure? And uh, June 28, they come around and say, okay, well, just to let you guys know as an update, you know, I know it's about three months later. We haven't had people be getting sick for a while. You know, Yuma, Arizona hasn't been shipping out any lettuce. So, you know, everything's coinciding. So we believe that, you know, the pieces are fitting together and it has now ended. So now that this epidemic has ended, what are we going to do? Okay, well, we know the region and, you know, we keep testing and we found it in the water, in some water samples, this strain the O157H7, which was fingerprinted genetically, was the same one that was found in the sick people that they tested it. So they were able to link it. And it was coming from some canal, like in that Yuma region. So now that the E. coli bacteria could have entered into the water canal, they had to think, okay, well, what are we going to do? Are we going to treat the water canal? Are we going to, you know, keep going upstream, found what was going on there? You know, are we going to cut off the farms from there? You know, it, it's going to take more steps from there. So, you know, thankfully the harvest season had ended, so no more is coming out. And they said, again, you know, this outbreak appears to be over. So looking at the results now, what happened by, you know, about three months later, June 27, well, by the end there ended up being 210 cases. Again, reported because remember a lot of these people do not go to the hospital and seek care of them it ended up in 36 states 96 got hospitalized 27 ended up with complications of the hus and five deaths were reported so just if you were wondering where were the deaths one of them was in arkansas and ironically and unfortunately there was one case reported in arkansas and that was one death as well too there was california had one death minnesota had two deaths new york uh, had one death as well too. So that, that gives you your five that were right there. But again, you know, not everything is reported. We just try to get a picture of what's going on so we know where to look. Here's a little uh, epidemiological data, like a bar graph showing you what's going on. You can see it started here like about mid-March, the cases 
started to trickle out and uh, end by about the beginning of June with a bit of a peak right here in early to mid-April. And it coincides because somewhere here around the end of April, the harvest had stopped. No more lettuce was coming from Arizona and the shelf life of the lettuce is about three weeks. So, you know, nobody's going to be getting sick after that. So um, basically, you know, changes from baseline. We basically talked about this as, yes, there was a huge change from baseline. You know, you're looking down here. You're more than doubling. The year's not even over yet. So that's just, you know, some things they were looking at from the results of what was going on. So what can you take home from this uh, prevention, treatment? What did they do? And, you know, again, what should you learn to take home? So one of the things is they told everybody in terms of prevention here we're talking about is stop eating the lettuce. If it's coming especially from Yuma, Arizona, don't eat the lettuce. Eat some other green. Eat spinach. Eat kale. Eat something else. I don't know. Just don't eat the lettuce. Another thing is, okay, if you're going to insist on eating the lettuce and you know you know it's not from Yuma, even if it is from Yuma, wash wash the lettuce just you know rinse it under you know cold running water for a while some people like to do like three parts of water to one part of vinegar also you know separate your meats from your uh greens so the meats don't drip down or to the side also use different cutting knives you know proper hygiene while you're cooking or cutting boards and uh you know of course wash your hands so you know start practicing these things to help to prevent it and in terms of cooking, I know it's not really for the vegetables, but more for the meat, is make sure you cook your meat to 160 degrees Fahrenheit and cook it all the way through. Now, a lot of you are like, well, that's not how I lock my steak, but, you know, steak, E. coli, you know, you got to start to weigh it out. Now, in terms of tr treatment, uh, it's just symptomatic, basically. Symptomatic means you treat, this, treat the, the, symptomatic means you treat the symptoms. So if you have a fever, take Tylenol things like that. In terms of E. coli, you're dehydrated, so drink some water. Why dehydrated? Because you're going to the bathroom consistently from the diarrhea, so you got to keep drinking water. You don't realize how much you're actually losing through there, so drink more than you think you should drink because you can always urinate it. You should always get rid of it. Now, antibiotics, as you're thinking maybe because, oh, it's a bacteria, it is a possibility, but it still remains a controversy because some uh, physicians say that it could precipitate or it could cause or increase the incidence of complications through the hemolytic ureic syndrome. Finally, a conclusion. What can we look at here? What was the accuracy of the investigation for such a short period of three months? Well, not everybody seeks medical attention, as you recall, right? In 2015, 6,000 were confirmed out of a possible quarter million because this is treated symptomatically. A lot of people say, I'm just going to stay home. Okay, I got diarrhea. You know, I'll just take care of it like that. So how can we get all the data? How do we know all those things exactly? Also the stories, you know, is everybody telling us the stories? And there's also many similar strains of the Shiga toxin as we were talking about, over 50. So are we tracing the right one? Is it being expressed? Is it not being expressed? You know, things like that. You got It's tough to connect. Uh, the water contamination source is still not found, which is, you know, I mean, sorry, the water the, the water source is found, but the contamination of the water has still not been found to date as of I have not found anything yet. Hopefully in the future they will get to it, see where it came from upstream. So this is going to lead to some, you know, long-term consequences. Like what are we going to do? Obviously we have to find what's infecting this water with this E. coli. Where is it coming from? Is it manure? Is it runoff? hopefully somebody not putting it in there you know things like that and what are we going to do in the meantime because okay there's no lettuce coming now but eventually are we going to allow to lettuce to come back or you know are we going to cut off the shipments for from yuma that season what are we going to do because you know it's still not 100 percent taken care of so just to kind of put that out there as what i'm talking about uh, just a couple months prior, at the end of 2017, last year, November and December, very short period, 25 people in 15 states got infected with E. coli. And um, it was the 157H7 strain. The thing they don't know, though, is what did it come from? They know it was a, a leafy green, but they don't know was it the Ramon, romaine lettuce. The reason is because the outbreak was so short-lived that they couldn't trace it back. So was it the romaine was it from Yuma? Was it from California? It's not known. So these are things to keep in mind in the future as we go in, especially when that season comes back, because maybe it's not over yet. And here are just some references that I use. I basically stuck to the CDC, uh, took from their articles and their papers and reports. Also the Florida Department of Health. That's where I grabbed the charts from to do the comparisons. The 
The Control of Communicable Diseases Manual is also very good to give me a background on E. coli and uh, its transmission, its, its resources, and things like that. And then, of course, the FDA, who works you know, side by side with the CDC to regulate the food going back and forth and to update the public as well, too, was a very helpful resource. So, you know, thank you for your time. This is what I have for you. This is for my class. If you're watching this for your own knowledge, this is what's going on right now. Hopefully, we'll learn more. If you have more information, post it below, post it in the comments. I will reply to you. Follow me on social media as we continue to discuss more medical topics. Stay up to date. Keep the knowledge, you know, going and, uh, you know, hopefully help out one another and share this. Like it, subscribe, do what you got to do. And, you know, let's keep going. Wish you guys all the best. Take care.